Welcome to this webinar that um, myself, Kay Maddox Baines, and Tristan Callahan are going to be running on level seven. So, Tristan and I have been teaching on the level seven program for more years than I care to remember. And we thought that we would share with you some of our experiences and some of the questions that students have asked us over the year. Um, so just a little bit about me firstly, and then I'm going to ask Tristan to introduce himself. I've been teaching on CRPD programs, oh, probably for over 20 years, I hate to say that. Um, and I've seen the CRPD qualifications change a number of times and over the last eight years, I think my focus has been really level seven. So in, in terms of that, um, I've, I've, I've also um, received lots of uh, questions from students about career development and, and when is the right time to take the programme. Um, and, and as I say, um, that's really what we're going to be talking about today. So Tristan, would you like to say a couple of words ab about you? Sure, okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Nice to see so many on the screen here. My name's Tristan Callahan. I've been teaching CIPD courses for nearly 20 years, uh, not as much as Kay uh, here, but I've delivered uh, CIPD courses across level three, which is equivalent to A levels. It's a foundation when people are starting on the course. The level five, which is equivalent to a degree level program, and we tend to get uh, learners who are uh, officers or advisors or wanting to get into HR at a slightly senior level and then on level seven uh, which is equivalent to uh, almost like a master's degree where we tend to get people who work in senior HR senior management or aspirations of doing this um, that rather simplifies it but I teach across all levels and yes I've seen and my K as well see many people do level three five and seven and do it successfully. So if many of you have coming from level three or five and thinking, well, is it right for me? What's the jump up? Um, we can give you a uh, lot of answers on this as well. So welcome all. Thanks, Tristan. It is interesting, Tristan's just mentioned that word, master's level. And uh, one of the questions that we get asked a, a lot at the beginning is what does M level mean so we we refer to m level quite a lot um, in terms of expectation and that's what it means it means studying at master's level so level seven master's level and in terms of the crpd qualification it's the highest level that you can study it prepares you to be a director of hr or a consultant so it is the highest level CRPD qualification and, and with that it, it brings obviously um, uh, its, its own challenges but the great thing I think about level seven is, is that it is a strategic level program. It actually provides you with the tools and techniques to look at an organisation as a whole entity and it really focuses on how HR can add value going forward. Tristan did you want to say anything about M level there? Uh, yes, uh, as Kay mentioned, it's a master's level qualification. So you go if you're used to doing a great degree or lower level qualifications, where you may for each subject got away with reading one core textbook. Um, generally, you'll find there's a lot more wider reading uh, here. I'm not here, and Kay's not here to gloss over the course to tell you it's a ride in the park. There is more wider reading. You're expected to read a range of textbooks, journal articles and research reports. Uh, but the end goal of that, of course, you get a qualification, but it's your knowledge you get, your knowledge to actually apply it in the workplace at a senior level to add real value to your organisation. So don't quite see as the extra work at level seven as an onerous task. Um, I always use the analogy, a bit like going to the gym, uh, which I haven't been to for about four months. I'm using the lockdown as an excuse uh, here. Uh, but I don't like, I've had a personal trainer because I don't have the motivation. I don't like my personal trainer because she tells me I need to do extra press 
precepts. And I think, can't you let me off with just 10 precepts? Uh, generally in the course, you will find us encouraging you to read a lot more and direct and learn. And it's there to increase your knowledge, to make sure, uh, using the analogy, uh, to make you fit uh, to practice at a senior level in your organisation. Yes, we, we, we are sort of like personal trainers, aren't we, Tristan? We're, we're, we're motivators. <laughs> we, do, we do really focus um, on that wider reading. And one of the other questions that we, we get asked right at the beginning is from some, well, I've, I've done an undergraduate degree, so how does that differ to doing a postgrad degree? Um, and, and quite often, it's, it's really focusing on um, more on that independent learning, and also um, on our ability to, to support you in, in knowing where to find these sources that are going to um, su support the process of that additional reading. Um, so for, for many, an undergraduate degree um, at, at level five, which is equivalent to the, the CRPD level five, um, we, we, we ask people in, in our induction sessions what they remember perhaps if, if they've done an undergraduate degree about that uh, process. Um, and quite often people will remember having to go to the library or, or perhaps um, taking responsibility for finding additional resources to support them in their learning. And, and of course, we can do as much learning as we'd like and, and as much reading as we like, but that needs to be evidenced in an assignment. And, and that's where the, the focus for level seven is, is very different to level five. And that's what we're going to come on to in a little while. Tristan, would you like to say something about how it differs from an undergraduate degree? Uh, it says on the info pack we can top up to MSC uh, and HRM it is not a master's level, but the CIPD label it as an M level qualification. So they label it as a master's level, um, but it's not considered. It's not a full master's degree you get out of this, but you can top up uh, to that as well. Uh, here, generally, it's um, well. How I answer this, it depends on the university to an extent. Uh, here. Uh, Generally with the CIP level seven, which is M level, master's level here, you tend to find a lot of consistency because CIP has the uh, rigorous standards to be followed. Um, I tend to find uh, it's a lot more uh, vocational and focused on professional practice on the level seven. Uh, that's the limited experience I've got delivering a, in a the master's program. And I'll pass that back on to Kay in the moment, who also teaches the masters in other institutions uh, here but it does actually depend on the university some universities i work in i won't name and shame it tends to be wholly academic and sometimes i do wonder how it relates to uh, current practice here that said it depends on the university and this high quality providers and uh, generally as well to simplify i find masters tend to be longer in terms of dissertations and more expensive uh, if you wanted an answer to that from there and i'll pass that back on to kay the, the master's level qualification in hr many your many universities offer this on a full-time basis for um for students who, who don't have much in the way of work experience so quite often masters in hr will be available to people who are recent graduates who might want to study full-time the other way universities offer master's degrees is on the part-time route where they're incorporating the um, postgraduate diploma the, the the great thing is um, with with this program um, at, at acacia is that you're able to top up your diploma um, so that you you really just have to do um just i say just <laughs> um a, a, another dissertation it's a longer dissertation it's probably around fifteen thousand words and then maybe a research module as well that goes with that but um absolutely the the, the difference generally is is that um universities offer a number of master's degrees that are full-time but they do that part-time also which is incorporating the postgrad diploma but actually you can top up if you've got this you can top up um where you 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 might find um a, a course that's most appropriate to your needs katie uh, says hi kay and tristan 
you're looking to begin your HR career and aspire to reach the senior level for HR director level in the future, would you recommend studying in le level seven straight away? Um, it's a very difficult question to answer. Generally, you do a diagnostic. If I keep with the fitness analogy, if I was to ask you all, could I run the marathon? Uh, am I able to run the marathon? You would ask a few searching questions. Well, how much training have you done before, Tristan? Um, how fit are you? Have you done anything previously to this? Um, it's the same with diagnosing whether a level five or level seven qualification is right for you. So I generally would ask, well, what knowledge do you currently have? Uh, what level are you currently operating at? Level five, uh, generally speaking, we would advise people to go on to level five if they haven't done a lot of academic qualification before. Uh, generally, if they're not quite so senior in the organization, although these aren't hard and fast rules, but generally speaking, when you become more senior, you get the exposure to some of these areas. Um, a whole lot of other factors. Uh, I sometimes ask, how busy are you in your life? For example, we've had some people right up to chief exec level undertaking level three and five. It's because they said they wanted the grounding, but they just didn't have the time or commitment to do the course. Where we've had some people who are HR assistants, but might have had an educational background i.e. a degree, uh, who have done very well on a level seven course. Uh, there's a whole range of different factors and variables you take into account. And of course, um, you won't, when you're deciding, you can phone up the Acacia office and these sort of questions will be asked. Uh, generally, I say, if you're going straight on to level seven without a, a lot of educational background, i.e. you haven't done a degree or been out of education for a long time. I often advise, well, come into our taster sessions, come to speak to us first of all, so you can actually gauge what the course content is. The advantage of taster sessions as well, you can speak to fellow learners. And I always say, and I will give all the glossy information, the course is great, it's wonderful, we're great tutors. Uh, but, you know, the learners will open your eyes to other things. They will say things, well, it's hard work here. Uh, there was a few things I wish I knew before I started so I could prepare for the course as well uh, here. Uh, these are the questions we encourage you to start asking uh, as well. So we can't totally decide whether a five or seven or three is right for you. It's about you having an appreciation of your own skill set and your own time constraints uh, here. And then we can discuss that um, as well. Um, but we've certainly had many learners who might have fears about, like yourselves, going on to a level seven course, uh, who may have not have had uh, a degree education, may have come through the level three, five route, who have done very well on the course uh, here. Yeah, I, I was just thinking actually when you were talking, Tristan, about a, a student that I had who, who I, I actually won our Student of the Year award a few years back, and um, she she didn't have an academic background, but she actually worked incredibly hard, and I and I think it comes back to the the time that you have available and and your own persistence in, in actually wanting to achieve the, this qualification so it, it at level seven it, it is um re really really challenging and it does come back to you um, a huge amount of um internal resource to uh, to actually m make it happen um so there, there's a number of cases that i can think of that the people who perhaps um I'm very aspirational who, who want, want to um, get to senior level positions as quickly as possible. And I've got the time to, to dedicate to, to making that happen. So I, I, I think that um, I, another one of the, the, the areas when, when you're thinking about it, I was, I was just thinking about this student and uh, she didn't have a, a first degree. Um, and, and, you know, this is the question that, that, that I hear quite a lot is I don't have a degree does this mean I can't apply? But absolutely not, absolutely not. So we, we have people coming onto the programme from um, such a 
a wide spectrum of life experiences, of work experiences and of educational backgrounds. And, and that's what makes our cohorts, I think, so interesting and diverse. And, and you know, one of the real strengths of, of learning in a group is the ability to, to share information and, and to share good practices and experiences. And re really not having a degree is, um, it is it's not a huge disadvantage as long as you have the working experience or the HR experience to make up for it. Um, and and I, I often find in groups we have perhaps um, fresh graduates or, or graduates with perhaps a one or two years experience working alongside people who have been working in HR for a number of years um, who perhaps don't have that first degree. And the two working together, hugely, hugely enriching and, and, and powerful. And, and that's through the, the various exercises and activities that we undertake is what actually makes the, the programme such a pleasure to deliver and, and such an enriching experience for, for students. Um, and and, and uh, one of the other, uh, of course, the, the, the caveat to, to that is, is, is just making sure that um, you have at least one or the other um, to, to be able to relate theory to practice, because this is what level seven is all about. It's about having the ability to understand the theory and um, that, that's great. But unless you can apply that, then, then that's actually of limited value going forward. Um, what, 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 what about your thoughts, Tristan, in terms of perhaps people that say they, they don't have any HR experience coming onto the programme? Okay, uh, well, I'll answer that and I'll answer some of the questions on the side panel because I think they all uh, work together. Uh, as Kay, Kay mentioned, uh, what about people who haven't got the HR experience? I say uh, coming straight on to level seven, it will be difficult. Although often when I start speaking to people who say they haven't got the HR experience and diagnose it, uh, often I find they may have more HR experience than other individuals. They're just not working in the HR department. So we get many people who work in an operational level who maybe have experience being a line manager and a supervisor. And then I start to find out, well, they've managed people, they coach people, they mentored people, and they've got all their exposure to a lot of other areas, which people in a HR department may not have. Um, so I don't say, don't get overly fixed if you haven't got the academic background. Sometimes we have someone with a degree, and they admittedly will say themselves, they scraped through the degree, and now they're working as a HR assistant. Uh, to all extents and purposes, they are working in HR, but they may not be appropriate for level seven. Uh, yeah. So generally, I will say is if you are working outside of HR, consider what other factors you have exposure to. So if you have some involvement in organizational development, of course, many will say that is HR, well, which is a debate in itself. Uh, or if you have exposure to strategy, uh, you've had exposure to budgets and bigger issues within the organization, it could be level seven is right for you uh, here. So uh, again, there's no hard and fast rules. Uh, again, I would say if you have concerns, you can speak to our course information team. You speak to us as tutors in the uh, taster sessions here. Uh, we will give an honest overview here. And um, what I mean by honest, uh, we're not out there to totally sell you a course. You know, we want to be ethical and we want to make sure you're doing the right course that's right for you. Uh, yeah. uh, the last thing we want is six months down the line saying, this has taken over my life. I'm reading so much. I'm stressed uh, here. Um, uh, I'll just go through a few of the questions. Uh, um, it's good you put in all these because it helps myself and Kay a lot. We, sometimes we get quiet sessions where we plan questions beforehand. But um, uh, let's say a uh, HR grad graduate, I'm at level five. Do you think it's best to gain work experience before I jump straight into uh, level five, uh, level seven? Well, you've got a level five qualification, so uh, you you would have got exposure to many of the theories there. The step up is you start critically evaluating some of the textbooks you read. And level five, you tend to analyze them and expect uh, 
accept some of the things that the theorist says. At level seven, you start interrogating this. You start thinking, well, how much research has a theorist done here? How much, uh, how many people have they spoken to? Have they just spoken to management or old people across the organization? So level seven, you scrutinize more. In terms of whether you should get work experience, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I know there's some people I can see on this system who jumped onto a course before they had the specific HR experience and it helped them into the role as well. So I'm not going to discount that. I say if you haven't got the HR experience, it may involve a lot of or a bit more extra reading here. Uh, it, when you're deciding on the course, we're not these actual barriers to stop you coming on a level five or level seven. We tend to facilitate the discussion. We want you going on the course that's right for you. We don't want you going on the course uh, in three, four months time. You think it's just too high a level for you and it's caused you stress. Uh, Generally, some of these questions are hard to answer without knowing fuller details of your knowledge, your background, and what other areas uh, you have uh, exposure to. Thanks, Tristan. I just want to pick up a couple of questions here. One is asking about the sorts of HR roles on the program. So the sorts of people, what, what um, roles are they operating in? And um, I, I'm just thinking of, uh, over the years, there, there's been such a diverse range of roles from um, HR officers, advisors, partners, managers, um, directors, deputy directors, that there's such a mix. And so it's really hard to answer that question because, you know, people are coming onto the level seven program at all stages of their career. And, and, and I think one of the, the great things about that, having a, a number of different um, sort of le levels of experience and uh, seniority, is just the ability to share that good practice. So, so really allowing people to support each other in their career journeys. Do you think a level seven on your CV must we separate you from other candidates when applying for jobs? Yeah. Uh, the answer is yes. I, I'm saying yes, not just from an occasion perspective. For some of you have been nodding, saying, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? But I would say yes. And I can see people nodding yes on the screen without singling them out. These are people we taught on level three, five. Uh, having a CID qualification for a start makes a huge amount of difference. Having that level seven as well, um, if many of you work in organizations and you advertise for a HR role, particularly during these COVID times, some of you will say you're getting hundreds of applications. So how are you going to shortlist and sift them? A quick, easy way, of course, is if they have a CIT qualification. And this is what I believe many organizations are doing, rightly or wrongly, uh, they're doing it. So I would say definitely yes. Are the modules longer than other levels? Are there exams and a dissertation? Uh, there, there are exams. Uh, the dissertation is embedded within a module called 7IBI, investigating a business issue, um, which you can actually develop for the master's program. Um, oh, can we run through the assessments? Two exams and a dissertation. Yes, so the other assessments are generally uh, I think there's, there's an essay report format. The, the CIPD like this term informal report. Um, but basically, it, it's um, a formal document that the key thing about assessments at level seven, um, they're predominantly written in um, academic form, which is basically writing in the third person, adhering to academic protocols, of good structure, um, underpinning theory, in-text citation, references, list, bibliography. Um, Aside from, from that, there is the opportunity to, to um, include for your skills for business leadership module a reflective statement, which is, I, I always think, the, the one opportunity where we, um, we have the opportunity to reflect on our own experience and our own learning and, and uh, lovely, lovely module because um, quite often in HR, we spend all of our time thinking about how we're supporting other people and the skills of business leadership, developing skills of business leadership, it's actually looking at us and how we're developing ourselves, which is fantastic. Um, so so that, that is the assessment for that. And then, um, as I say, the, the, the others are, are generally 
um, essay-based, report-based, and include also analysis of some case studies. So it's, it's very much focusing on the, the theory to practice. So learning about the theory, but very importantly then thinking about how it relates to practice through a case study that the CIPD have written. And then what, what we do as tutors th um, throughout the course is firstly de develop understanding, de work with you to develop understanding of theory, and then really try and unpick what the case study questions are asking to allow you to transfer that theory to that case. Um, we do that through the process of, of thinking through our own experience and how it relates to um, our, our own case studies, our, our, our living case studies. And, and of course, that, that's one of the, the benefits of working with groups um, who people where people are working at lots of different levels within the organisation because it brings out different points um, to be able to embed there. Uh, so I mentioned about being scared about academia. Uh, you, you won't be alone. You won't be alone. I'm sure uh, many of you will say this. I always emphasise that we give a lot of support within the sessions. We give examples. We get you working together in terms of evaluation and analysis. But I always argue people always think uh, academia and professional practice are two different ends of the spectrum. They shouldn't. They should interrelate with one another. Academia, I wouldn't be scared by the term, it's all about being critically evaluative, just not accepting practices, just because they're so-called tried and tested in other organizations. Uh, you will find so many consultancy organizations will tell you if you adopt XYZ engagement model or talent development model, it will make your organizations great. Now, what I tend to find in professional practice, uh, the organizations adopt them, spend thousands and thousands of pounds. Uh, when I've consulted in organizations, I say, well, we should really interrogate the evidence here. It's a bit like buying a car. Don't we actually look at the reviews, look at the evidence here before purchasing money on the car? I find so many organizations say, no, nah, that's too long. That's too academic for me. Let's go for it. Let's spend 50,000, 100,000 pounds on this. And lo and behold, two years later, they're scratching their heads, it didn't work. Uh, they say, well, let's check that away. It didn't work and let's go on to the next initiative. And I'm sure many of you, I've certainly worked in organizations, it's initiative after initiative after initiative, spending lots of money. And generally I find when I've worked in organizations, the managers say, well, we don't believe in academia. But academia, these are independent individuals, and they're not crusty professors in an office here. These are people who go out to organizations. They actually interrogate what works, what doesn't work. Uh, yeah. The academia is all about independence. It's about independently scrutinizing. When I was a head of HR and organizations, I had all sorts of consultancy organizations. So, by the way, I'm not demeaning consultancy organizations, some are excellent, promising the world. But I say, well, what evidence have you got this works? And they say, well, this organization has seen extra profits since they put it in place. And I say, yeah, but that's surely to do with the economy, isn't it? At the time, organizations were growing. Uh, here. These are the things you start questioning. It's what's known uh, as critical evaluation. And it's looking at causation and correlation. And I don't want to scare you with terms, but you start analyzing and evaluating these. And on that point, and I'll let you, go back to cave. Let's imagine you just went ahead with initiatives. You looked at some so-called organizations that successfully adopted a practice. Then you convince your senior board to actually adopt it. They spend 50,000, 100,000 pounds. It all goes wrong. And you know people blame HR. Who will they blame if it doesn't work? It'd be HR. So we have to have a more critical eye on things. And this is what level seven is about. It's about actually identifying, looking at the research to see what can work in practice. Uh, yeah, so as I say, academia one side, professionalism one side of the spectrum, they should come together as a whole.
if you completed level five, can you use some of your material within level seven? Uh, you can do, you can adapt the material. Level seven goes to a higher level. You don't get any accreditation for level seven. So just because you've done, for example, employment law at level five, it doesn't mean to say you get accreditation where you can miss some of level seven employment law. It's on a different level, but you can certainly use the information you had and build on it. I'll go back to you in a moment, Kay, but on that point, because someone asked about uh, reading on here. At level seven, the expectation is, and we guide you to core textbooks, uh, but being a member of the CIFD, which many of you have done level three or five will know, is you've got access to a huge amount of resources as part of your membership here. Journal articles and research reports, uh, as well. And this is the expectation on level seven. You start delving into these, whereas textbooks tend to be quite generic on a subject. You will start finding more research specific to your industry, specific to your organization type here. And then it tends to be interrogated more academic research as well by fellow academics. They will question their research, which is what we encourage you to do. Yeah, in, in, in terms of um, textbooks, I, I always say that textbooks are out of date as soon as they're written. Um, one of the things that the CIPD say is that when you're looking at sources to support your submissions or assessments, they should be contemporary. So what we're looking at is ideally the last three years. Um, most textbooks take a minimum of two years to actually write. Um, and then, of course, they have to go through the publication process. So for, for my mind, textbooks are great for giving you the backbone. But at level seven, what we really want to see is use of the peer reviewed journals. And you can use databases such as EBSCO, which you can access to the CIPD Knowledge Hub. Um, and peer reviewed journals are, are basically journals that have gone through a, a rigorous process of peer review which basically means they've been considered by experts in the field and they might be practitioners or academics um, and they don't get published until they've gone through a number of um, iterations so that they they are um, the, the best that they can be um, and these journals get published more quickly than textbooks they, they're based on the absolute latest contemporary thinking in the field, and they're going to be the sources that can really help you to think differently. So the, the, the great thing about level seven is really having the opportunity because the, the modules are, are that much longer um, and the learning outcomes that much uh, more in depth, that gives you a real fantastic opportunity to, to get into the subject matter and really start to understand it rather than just be able to describe and explain it. And this is one of the things about the assessment criteria at level seven. It moves from describing, explaining, analyzing, evaluating to this critical element. Um, I, I just wanted to, to have a look at um, this, this question on in internationalization. Okay, the certificate and the full diploma. Well, if you do the level seven certificate, you're only doing four modules. If you do the diploma, you're doing eight modules. So it's about the depth, uh, the breadth of actual areas you cover. Uh, here. Um, I say doing the diploma, you get a more holistic experience of a range of different HR areas uh, here. Uh. The, the diploma generally takes about two years. If, if you are working full time, I'm, I'm very reluctant to advise people to do it in less time. It, it is a lot of work. I know some people have taken some time out or perhaps have extended holiday to be able to take a couple of modules at the same time. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm admiring anyone that can do that. It's, um, it, it's a huge undertaking um, try, trying to do a couple of assessments at the same time. But, you know, people do it. So it's not to say that you can't do it. Um, and the, the, one of the great things I think about Acacia, and I work with, with uh, different providers, but with Acacia, um, one of the great things is the flexibility in the programs that are offered and and, and uh, you, you just don't see that in, in with other institutions you know you can you can sign up um pretty much really really quickly be on this program studying um and also you can be studying online and, and perhaps 
in the future post COVID, one day I'm not quite sure if we're going to ever be able to use this term now post COVID, but you're going to be able to have the option of studying in, in class um, and blended. So this huge amount of flexibility. Um, and as I, as I say, that enables you, no matter what your geographical location, to, to study with people um, internationally, which is fantastic for, for building networks and, and supporting you in understanding some of these key concepts. Um, on, on a much wider basis. I'm going to hand over back to Tristan, who wants to pick up any more of these questions. Go from the most recent, is it possible to do a diploma in one year if you study full time? Uh, it can be, because as Kay said, there's a flexibility here. You can mix and match. We do online sessions, we do weekend sessions, we do weekday sessions. Uh, Let's say it's a lot of hard work and a lot of reading. I wouldn't totally advise against it because people have done it. Uh, yeah. But I would say tread carefully. If you believe you can do it and you've got the time to do it, uh, i say go for it. Um, uh, particularly, as you said, you're studying full time. But again, it's always hard to get a definitive answer because it depends on your level of knowledge and background and experience before. And some will find it easier to do than others. Uh, yeah. Once you've completed a certificate, can you top up to the diploma later on? Most definitely, we can facilitate that. And there's chances of topping up to a master's as well. I want to have charter membership and would like to know what is required given that level seven only accredits to associate level. Well, CIT facilitate that. You can actually, you apply directly to the CIT once you actually get your qualification. Uh, then you put in an application and a discussion to show you're demonstrating practice to a higher level, i.e. a strategic level at the CIPD. Um, uh, but having the diploma certificate certainly helps uh, from here. Um, and, and the other question which, which, which I like is, is about um, justification for the level seven. So, for example, if, if you're going to be um, trying to source funding from your employer, how are you going to justify this programme, um, particularly if, if, if your employer is much more keen for you to do a level five? Um, well, that could be because it's slightly cheaper. Um, for you, it will be quite uh, a, a lot shorter, I suppose. But uh, I mean, I'm a big believer in that uh, the level seven qualification does provide you with, as I said right at the beginning, the, the tools, the techniques, the ideas, the, the knowledge and the understanding to be able to operate at the very senior levels in HR. So. Um, Otherwise, why would we have a level seven? Why would we have a progression route? Then, so 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 I I believe that the justification for studying at level seven is that you you're able to spend more time in actually really getting involved in in the, the sorts of ideas that we're, we're talking about and looking at how you can ultimately add value to the organisation. So studying at level seven is about how you're adding value strategically, not just thinking about responding and reacting to perhaps what other um, your, your line manager wishes to happen, but really understanding what does this organization need me to do in HR to make a difference? How am I actually going to advance the organization forward through my role within the organization? So seeing a direct relationship between what you're doing and where the organization is heading and really focusing on what, what is the organization's vision and mission, strategic objectives, and how do they align to what you're doing within the organization? And I think that for me is the real value of this program because it is so strategically led so um, if, if you're trying to justify to your employer, I think that's the message that I would be sending. This is really how you can add maximum value. Um, and I, I think also that um, if you are going to be, be, be looking at um, transferring from perhaps a level three and, and you're thinking that you, you, you have a lot of work experience already. Something else that you might consider and what Acacia offer is something called the experience route. Um, and if that does apply to you, if you do have a huge amount of experience in one particular area, 
it might be that you can get in contact with us and send us your CV and your current person spec so that we can actually get a sense of how your experience would support the learning outcomes for a particular module that you're interested in. So this is sort of the, a competency-based assessment is looking at what you've done historically to support you in actually being able to meet the, the learning outcomes. Now, I it, it have to say, it's, there are still a number of things that you have to do. You, you don't just get a tick in the box. You do have to still compile um, a, a literature review and you have to compile evidence in support of the criteria, but it does mean that you don't have to take the same assessments. So that is another um, consideration if you do have a lot of experience. As, as I say, if, you, if that's something that you, you, you want to for, for us to consider, then do get in contact and we can have a look at that and, and see if you would be eligible. I have to say also that the, the disadvantage, of course, of that route is that it's looking historic historically rather than ahead so it wouldn't necessarily prepare you for the new contemporary developments in hr which the cipd are currently focusing on um, when in, in association with the development of the new hr profession map the internationalization of hr the digital economy and ethical leadership so those three things are, the, are really the, the corner point of, of what's coming within the new HR qualifications. There's a couple of uh, questions about the competency-based route and, and people just wanted to have clarification as to how they would actually go about that. So it's really, if you, if you give us a ring or um, send us an email and we can talk to you more about that competency-based route. So essentially what we will need from you is an up-to-date CV and a current person specification so that we can analyze what, what you have there. We might need to, to have uh, a, a chat with you also and then we can analyze your previous experience and your previous education against the learning outcomes for whatever particular area you're, you're looking to get um, prior experience based on so um, do, do get in contact with us and then we can have a look at how you might fit into that criteria um, the, the CIPD I don't know whether you're aware but the CIPD has become much more international in its focus um, and for example Acacia now have got a, an office in the in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and we also deliver in uh, Bulgaria and we've in the past delivered in Gibraltar a huge um, array of, of different partnerships also in, in various places in the Middle East and, and the great thing is this program is becoming in uh, the, the whole of the CIPD curriculum and, and the recognition of membership is becoming much more widely um, recognised through, throughout the globe. Um, the, the CIPD have got a reciprocal recognition agreement with the Australian HR community. So it does give you a huge amount of opportunity if you do want to have an international career um, to, to, to take undertake this study now um, and, and really work towards upgrading your membership as you develop, develop experience going forward. Tristan, did you want to pick up any more of these questions yeah, coming through? I will do it because I think the question was asked about Spain and Poland. Uh, uh, to an extent, uh, a lot of HR work we're finding is, uh, I'll be careful with the terminology, it's an exam question or an assessment question in itself, but HR is becoming more universal. Uh, whenever we deliver in different parts of the world, some big significant ones, uh, current organization, which I'm sure many of you are all aware of now, is the World Health Organization. We delivered, uh, of course, Pan-Africa, uh, so in 25 different states in Africa, uh, here north, south, mid-Africa, uh, west and east, all across Africa, uh, amazed us how much of a similarity there was in terms of processes here, in terms of systems, in terms of the literature that was used as well. And uh, not just Western literature, we're finding more and more uh, there's a huge increase in HR literature from China, Japan, the Middle East in particular, and South America. So HR is becoming, uh, there's the identification, it's becoming 
far more global. And we delivered DP Worlds as well. And I think that was massive. That was across all the continents uh, globally. Um, but we're finding, um, well, when we find there's uh, so many common practices, but it's very good exposure to find different ways of doing things and exploring different cultures. So there's generally, you tend to find the same issues, but you need to actually apply the different issues to meet the scenarios. But that's the same for all organizations. Like we're not just talking national cultures. I'm sure all of your organizations all have their specific organizational cultures and subcultures, dare I say it. Uh, yeah. I've talked a lot about On that point, I may pass you on to Kay. Acacia at the moment are, are delivering um, live online as most providers are. And of course, that's giving, I'm just looking at some of these questions here, that's providing opportunities for people to be able to uh, come onto our programs, no, no matter the geographical barriers that, that you might have previously faced. Um, so absolutely, this, this is available online to you. Yeah, um, I work in other institutions, uh, and other institutions I work in, I'm not too disgruntled, they just shut down totally, and I'm still getting paid for that. Uh, with a case of learning, Straight away, we went online, Jen, and learners actually quite like it. Uh, and it's not what uh, you may be used to with traditional online courses. We had many learners saying to us, I didn't want to do online or occasional learning, but COVID forced it on them. They said they were surprised at how interactive the sessions were. Similar to where we are now, they started seeing each other more. Those of you Zoom before, you can quickly allocate people into groups. So we got people group working, interacting. We still had fun and games here. Some I can see who are nodding at me. I still played family fortunes with individuals and put quizzes into it. Online them has tended to open new eyes uh, here. Um, and I say even post-COVID, if that ever happens, uh, even post-COVID, I say don't discount uh, doing options where you, because we have flex, where you can do some modules within a training room and some modules online as well. It, it makes you sort of te technologically agile as well here. So, um, I'm, I know I'm promoting the course again and promoting a case to the hill, but the flexibility we have where you can mix and match modules and delivery, whether it's online, it's physical, I don't see in many other uh, institutions here. I think that the, the main point really that we were trying to get over is that it, it's actually not, not easy to tell you exactly what the assessment criteria is for, for coming onto the Level 7 programme because really it, it depends on you. It depends on how much time you have, your, your previous work experience, your previous academic experience, um, and quite often your, your own sort of personal drive to, to get to the end and, and uh, com complete all of the assignments in, in, in the time frame that, that, that you've set yourself um, as, as much as anything. Um, um, I, I think just one of the things, just, just to really reiterate, it, it is a big commitment, it does take time, but uh, everyone that I've worked with over the years has said, you know, there were some points that I, some points during the time I was taking my programme with UK, I didn't think I could go on anymore. And, and I did it, and I'm so pleased to have got to the end. So um, in, in actual fact, looking back, you know, of all the qualifications that I've undertaken, I actually think that my postgraduate diploma was the most difficult, even more difficult than my master's. Um, and I don't know why that was particularly, but it was so worth it because it was like a bridge going from an undergraduate to sort of the postgraduate degrees. Um, so we're just about coming to the end of our session now. Um, do, do remember you, you can call us to ask more questions, to find out more about coming on to any one of our programmes or about the competency-based route. But otherwise, I um, just want to thank you so much for your time, um, for um, all of your fantastic questions that really make a session. So best of luck making your decisions going forward and with whatever Level 7, Level 5 diploma you decide to embark on. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.